with David Weatherly? <laughs> well, that's a question. <laughs> that's a question. I. It's the first question I asked. I know who you are. Lots of people know who you are, but who are you? Um. Wow, I don't think I've ever been asked that exactly like that before. <laughs> Everybody exactly. reads the bio, of course, and you know, uh, in the course of conversation, these kind of things come up. You know, I guess I, I'm a, a seeker, a shaman, somebody who's very curious about the strange things that occur in the world, and uh, been that way since I was a kid. Got interested in pursuing the unknown, so to speak, in the 70s and have never looked back. And it's taken a lot of different twists and turns for me. But, you know, that's really been a driving passion, whether it's exploring haunted locations or cryptids or psychic phenomena or real magic or any number of things. And I've been very blessed to be able to spend my life basically pursuing that and traveling around the world and uh, having some pretty cool experiences along the way. I love that question. It's always a zinger right off the bat. <laughs> um, what got you into the paranormal? Experiences when I was a kid, uh, you know, I, I used to listen to my grandmother tell stories about uh, some of my ancestors who had strange things happen to them. And for me, in, in some ways, it was a little bit of a, a way to rebel. I sort of grew up as an only child. I've got one brother, but he's 10 years older. So by the time I was, you know, really thinking about these kind of things, I mean, he has moved out and, and gone. And I was, uh, in some ways, I guess, kind of the black sheep, you know, of the family, because I was interested in all these weird things and no one else really was. Uh, and bear in mind, again, you know, I was born in the 60s, I grew up in the 70s. So it, it wasn't cool or hip, you know, it wasn't part of pop culture. And for me, it was kind of the the rebellious thing to do, I guess. And, you know, the more people thought it was strange, I think the more interested I was in it. <laughs> so uh, it, it was right at a crucial time too, because, you know, a lot of things were starting to come out. Books were coming out. Fate Magazine was around. That was a big influence. Uh, and of course, in the seventies came in search of with Leonard Nimoy. And that was, that was a really cool thing, you know, at the time, because, wow, here's a television program that's, asking all these questions that I've been thinking about and exploring these topics. And of course, you know, some things I hadn't heard of before. So uh, all those things, you know, just sort of dovetailed into the interest. And I was always a, a very, uh, I was always very much a reader. I'd read anything I could get my hands on. So early on, you know, I was gravitating towards all those curious things, uh, you know, books about ghosts and ancient aliens and all these things that I could find. Uh, shamanism and really delving into it in that way that's um it's kind of funny how you mentioned that about your brother was older and you got into it as a rebellion sort of thing um same with me my sister is 16 years older than me so I essentially grew up as an only child as well all right so you and understand I do um yeah. I'm a little younger so my <laughs> era was um remember the, the movie I think it was in 1985 or 1986 the monster club or the monster squad oh yes yeah. Called classic now yeah. um that, that that's what got me into it i i drew all the wolf man and all the vampire stuff and i would start yeah. books from the library on ghosts and and all that stuff and it just escalated from there well and prior to uh in search of i had Colshack, the night stalker you know so i don't know if you've ever seen that before or remember no. it it was oh man you don't know what you're missing it was really it was a heavy influence on the x-files and it was uh it was filmed in the 70s and it's darren mcgavin who is a kind of a bumbling reporter who stumbles into all these bizarre stories that he wants to write about. So uh, it's, you know, it's equal parts, kind of the, the mythology and the lore. And also here's this guy who really kind of doesn't know what he's doing, but he's, he's going after the story anyway. So he stumbles along and he, you know, he, he'll, he'll drop his camera and the flash will go off and stuff like this. And, uh, you know, stories about vampires and, uh, other a swamp monster, other weird creatures that come along in the series, but it's it's a classic. Oh, I'll check that one out. Yeah. Um, what was your first experience? First experience was probably, um, <laughs> believe it or not, seeing an apparition. Okay. Uh, it was 
it was a really interesting, I haven't told this story very often, uh, but the, the house I grew up in was a house that my dad built and it was in the country. Um, down a dirt road, believe it or not, and uh, were no other houses really down there until initially. And then a few other people came and built, but um, someone came and built a house close to ours and it was actually, there was a lot in between. So there was some wooded space in between our home and the second home. Uh, but what we learned much, much later on was that the, the second house that was built was actually built uh, partially on an old cemetery. <laughs> Okay. I know this sounds very cliche, but it was an old, it was an old fi uh, family pioneer cemetery. There's only a handful of graves there, probably, uh, probably less than half a dozen. Uh, but we learned this later on because the woman who owned that other house, she ended up finding out that the, the, the guy who was selling the land had gone in there and, and pulled up the, two, the headstones. There were two or three of them and just pitched them back behind this uh, ditch at the back of their property. And uh, she got it out of him <laughs> later on that the Grays actually were on this, you know, on her property. But all that, all that aside, uh, we did learn that there had been some homes there in the area many, many years before, before probably the 1800s or something. Mm -hmm. And um, there were some strange things that happened. There were very strange things that happened in her home. She had very poltergeist-like activity occurring in her house but uh we had a few things in our house too we heard uh, i would hear voices occasionally and uh, some odd things would occur you know there was a, a back door at um, the side of our house that would come open all the time and of course my father was a complete skeptic about anything he always insisted that you know it's, a, it's the wind or a draft or you know and he he must have changed that lock, you know, four or five times, <laughs> you know, changing the whole whole door set uh, to try to get it to stop doing that, uh, which never worked. But um, yeah, so we had these different kinds of incidents like that. And then uh, at one point I was home alone. My parents, I can't remember where they were, but uh, I was a teenager and I saw, uh, heard something and saw what appeared to be an apparition of a woman in our house in the hallway. And uh, it was kind of hair raising really was uh, but you know at the same time it was like after afterward i was just thought oh my gosh you know what do i do with this and how do i <laughs> you know how do i make this happen again <laughs> because i want to want to figure out exactly what's going on so uh you know it was a uh, uh, yeah it was quite an experience okay um next question i ask everyone as well it's kind of the probably one of the most basic questions you're going to get um, what's your most scariest experience out of all of the things you've done? One that comes to mind. Ross had a good one. Ross, it was one that involved you. Where, um, you guys were <laughs> the <my> Blair house. <laughs> one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. You know, I'll, I'll give you one, but it's not uh, it's not exactly paranormal in, in nature. Uh, and here's the deal. You know, Here's the thing, Mike, I'm the guy that when people are running out of a location and I've seen this happen, I, I'm the one telling them to get out of the way so I can get in Me too. Uh, because I want to document or see what's going on. Uh, but, uh, you know, what always concerns me is the human element of things and the dangers, especially in recent years that you have to deal with. And there was an incident uh, quite a number of years ago now that uh, took place at a ghost town out west and i had investigated this location several times um it was a very remote spot you know would go out there and and it had uh several abandoned buildings plus a, a cemetery all of which were very actively haunted and on one occasion i, I went out i had one other person with me and uh it's a, a long kind of winding road that goes up to the spot and as we're coming up this last portion i thought i saw lights somewhere around uh where the cemetery side was and uh so we stopped and, and got out of the vehicle and approached very slowly because i thought well you know what's there's no telling it could be some kids up here or, or whatnot anyway uh to make the story shorter we ended up going up to about where the cemetery was and there was a ridge just on the other side of the cemetery there's enough moonlight that I could see that someone was walking along the ridge. So I kind of kind of crouched down so the person was back with it a little bit more and realized that they're walking around with a shotgun or a rifle, you know, one of the two. Oh. 
so backed out of there very, very slowly, you know, back to the vehicle and got out as, as quick as possible. And uh, later learned from a local law enforcement guy I uh, was having a conversation with just a, a few days afterwards. Uh, he says, oh, yeah, you were up there? He says, yeah. Uh, well, we had an incident up there because um, some guys had, had uh, mobile meth lab parked in the oh, <laughs> gully behind the, <laughs> behind the uh, cemetery there. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, this is really that's so because those kind of people i mean they'll just shoot you and you know gonna be a ghost <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so you know i always tell people you just have to be very cautious and you know a lot of ghost hunters these days they go into abandoned buildings and in different uh remote locations and you just never know what human element you're gonna have to contend with so asbestos. You know. <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's that's a whole different kind of scary <laughs> yeah but I get what you said. I had a similar situation when I was at a town close to Barkerville, the one that you went to, not at Barkerville. This was kind of in the middle of the mountains. We were getting ready to investigate and um, a guy pulled up in a car and in Canada, you're not allowed to have a handgun anywhere outside of a, a range. Like our right. are really, really strong here. And um, he flashed a handgun on his passenger seat and he's like, don't go near my mines. I'm like, we got you. <laughs> wow. So Yeah human element yeah exactly it's it's a lot more frightening than the paranormal i can tell you 100 <laughs> percent. um for people who don't know about black eye what black eyed children are can you tell us i'm curious <laughs> with this one I, I like the black eyed children stuff <laughs> yeah i mean the 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 capsule version is that uh these Entities have been showing up now for uh, decades. A, a lot of people mistakenly believe that the phenomena showed up uh, only in the 90s, uh, but that's not true. The, the sightings go back far, far earlier than that. Uh, it's just that they weren't called Black Eyed Kids back then. Uh, the acronym BEK came along in the 90s. It's really stuck, has well as the term Black Eyed Kids or Black Eyed Children. And uh, it's used to describe these entities that show up uh, asking for entry uh, into your home, your business, your vehicle sometimes. And they are, uh, they appear to be kids, uh, except for a few curious things. They are usually very pale skinned. They have solid black eyes. Uh, typically appear anywhere uh, between the ages of 12 or 13 up through uh, mid-teens. Uh, that's the most common frame that people place them. They're usually dressed in a very nondescript way. It's uh, typically drab clothing, no logos or anything like that. Um, and they'll knock on your door and ask to come in. And it, it will be very strange language typically. You know, they'll say, uh, we just thought we'd stop by for a while. Uh, and, you know, the, the witness is thinking, I've, you know, you've got the wrong place. I, I, I've never seen you kids before. That's okay. We'll come in anyway. Just invite us in. Uh, so it's, you know, these very unsettling encounters that people have. And, and typically it goes through three stages. There's an initial stage of une uneasiness on the witness's part. Uh, usually these kids won't look directly at the person initially. They'll stand with their heads down or hands in their pockets or, or something like that. And uh, then it, it rapidly escalates to uh, the witness becoming much more nervous and, and having the personal warning signs go off, you know, whether it's the hair on the back of the neck or the queasiness or, or whatever it is. And then this escalates to the point of uh, flight. Uh, I, I don't say fight or flight because no one feels like fighting these kids. They just want to get away from them. So, you know, they'll slam the door or drive away or, or run away, whatever they can to get away from these quote children. Um, I don't believe they're children at all, of course, uh, but it's a curious phenomenon because it has connections to so many different types of uh, other weird encounters. You know, it has things in common with, men in black for instance or uh, ghostly encounters there are connections to uh, 
the so-called alien hybrids and all these different things. And when I wrote the book, uh, the book is, oh gosh, it's uh, well over 10 years old now, I think. And I initially, uh, you know, wrote it to examine all these different correlations and kind of throw some different ideas out as to what these things might be, let people decide on their own. Uh, but it, it's, it's a very weird, weird phenomena. You know, it's, it's kind of like a modern mythology in some ways. But again, you know, going back, I mean, I, I found sightings uh, way back. I found sightings in the 50s and, and before. Right. And uh, of course, you know, since that time, more and more people have uh, continued to research and dug up old encounters uh, that, uh, you know, they they can say, oh, yeah, clearly this is the same type of phenomena that was going on, you know, at this time. It just, uh, again, didn't have that acronym. And what do they want? Okay, you invite them in mistakenly. That's a good question, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> now, you know, Whitley, Whitley Strieber, uh, I was talking to him at one point, and he said, because he's very intrigued by the phenomenon, he said, you know, what disturbs me is, is uh, the potential that people let them in and we just don't know. <laughs> and that is kind of an unsettling uh, idea, you know, if you think about it in those terms. I, I can tell you that the people that have had closer encounters with them, uh, the closer the encounter, the more dire the circumstances seem to be. So I, I've talked to people, for instance, who have reached out and touched one of them. And in the aftermath, they've had illness or misfortune or, you know, any number of things happen in their lives. So in that sense, they, they seem to be, they could be harbingers of something or, or they could be, you know, some people think they're omens uh, because of some of the things that have occurred to quote, victims in the aftermath. It's really difficult to say. It, ultimately, we just don't know because there's not enough information in that sense. Hmm. True. In your book, Strange Intruders, you go over many areas and means of the jinn, shadow people, grinning men, and slender men. In your opinion, what are they and why are they here? So the book, Strange Intruders, really examined a lot of potential uh, intersections between our world and other levels of existence. That's how I look at it. You know, when I when I had that cover design idea, I pitched it out to my artist. And I, I like I the said, cover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I pitched it out to the artist and I said, here's what I want. I want to, here's the list of entities I want on the cover. And I said, I, I want to show them the initial idea actually was them coming through a mirror. And it was just a, a bit too complex to really portray and get across well. And, and we came up with the idea of it just being glass. So it's just, as if they're on the other side of glass and they're, they're kind of coming through. And that harkens to this concept of portals and other dimensions. And, you know, it's funny because it's a, a concept that I've looked at from early on in my explorations of these things, simply because so many ancient cultures around the world talk about this idea of other levels of existence. And for the longest time, that sounded like, oh, it's, that's new age or it's kind of crazy. You know, people would say, no, 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 no. Even, even people in this field used to say to me, well, that's, you know, that's a bit out there. And now what do we have? Uh, we've got quantum scientists saying, you know what? Uh, there's, we've proven there, <laughs> there's a, a dozen other levels of existence. You know, we don't know how to get there, but we know they're there. And of course, my question to that is, well, now, just because we can't get there doesn't mean that something there can't get here. True. And I think really this goes back to this somewhat simplistic idea that there are other levels of existence. Uh, but again, hearkening back to these ancient traditions, uh, they say that, you know, other things used to live here on this planet with us and they left. They left through a doorway or a portal or a hole in the sky or, or whatever it was. Uh, who's to say that those things have ever stopped coming across into our world? I, I don't think the intersections went away. I don't think the openings went away. Uh, we can't necessarily perceive them right now as humans, but I think if we start looking at some of these areas on the planet that are concentrations of high strangeness, uh, we can start to get a sense of, you know what? Yeah, there are these crossing points where it's very likely something is coming through. Uh, you know, whether that is 
the jinn or shadow people or, or what it is, is, it's hard to say. Some people would argue, oh, this is all, uh, you know, one singular type of entity and it's just coming through in different forms. That may be the case. Uh, but, you know, it may also be that we're interacting with different things uh, from, from different places. And I think the more, the more we advance, both scientifically and spiritually, the more we'll start to understand exactly what we could potentially be dealing with in that sense. So really to come back full circle to your, sort of to your question, <laughs> you know, Strange Intruders is somewhat of an examination of saying, here are some potential things that we may be dealing with, you know, uh, on this planet. And perhaps we've been dealing with them for a very long time. Uh, the book is done sort of as an evolution, you know, the, the jinn, for instance, are one of the most ancient concepts of this uh, idea of another race that lives here amongst us. Uh, we can't necessarily see them, uh, but it doesn't mean that we're not interacting with them. And when you get into the whole lore of the jinn, you find out that, uh, you know, just as a basic concept, uh, they were banished. You know, Allah banished them to where? Well, to somewhere they're not really gone though all the all the holy texts from that part of the world talk about the jinn well they're there but they're not mm -hmm. so they're here but they're not where do they live well they live in abandoned buildings or in the desert or in the you know the space between spaces well that says to me we're talking about other dimensional existence so uh, it's as it's as if they were you know kind of condemned to exist here, but not quite on the same physical level that we do. And I think when you start looking at a lot of these concepts that float around the areas we explore, like jinn and shadow people, uh, we're really, we, we seem to be dealing with interdimensional entities. And uh, that's what I've thought for a long time. That's what I think the Black Eyed Children are, actually, is some kind of okay. interdimensional entity uh, that has mastered or, or never lost the ability to come and go as they please. My coworker, he's from the Middle East and um, he comes from a farm. They used to have goats and sheep and there's a big farm. And um, he's scared mm. shitless of gins. Mm -hmm. He said there was a dead tree in the middle of his field where his goat and sheep were. And his family said that a gin lived in there because whenever his livestock would go near the tree, they'd become sick or die. And so it was all grass where his goats and all that were, um, mm -hmm. except around the tree. It was all dead and they mm -hmm. couldn't get rid of the tree. They tried cutting it down. All of their, their axes would, would get like become dull and all that it sounded pretty, even just bringing up the gin, he gets all weird. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, there's a, there's a core belief, you know, amongst, um, amongst people that uh, in the Middle East that, well, anyone actually who practices Islam, uh, that, you know, even talking about them draws their attention and you don't want to do that. So, you know, it, it's taboo in some areas to even mention the term, the name. Uh, you, you don't bring it up uh, because it, it, it pulls them to you. And that's the last thing you want to do. And, you know, one of the curious things about that tradition is, and I point this out to people, uh, we have, oh gosh, how many millions of uh, Muslims now on the planet. You know, it's, it's at last counts, the fastest growing religion on the planet. Mm -hmm. And the adherents, you know, one of their basic tenets is that uh, you must believe, if it's written in the holy text, you must believe in it, you know. Uh, and the jinn are talked about. So essentially you've got, uh, you know, millions or a couple of billion, whatever it is now, uh, Muslims who believe in the jinn. And all that energy goes into. So exactly. So, you know, what does that create? You yeah. know, having that many people who believe in something, what does that in itself create or what does it co-create? And, you know, that gets into territory that uh, those are some of the things I think as researchers, we should really be delving into and exploring even more because the, the human interaction with the paranormal, it's often set aside uh, especially in recent years because of, you know, the entertainment value is, is if someone runs screaming or, you know, you know shouts because they hear a noise, 
Uh, but really, we need to look at other concepts like, you know, how certain people um, respond in a location and how that location responds to them. You know, how combinations of people affect things. Mm. Uh, it's, it's so multi-layered that uh, it, it's, I mean, we could talk about that all night. Totally. Easy. Um, do you think human energy can create a haunting? I do. Yeah. Yes, a ab absolutely. Uh, you know, I, that kind of gets into Tulpa territory in a sense, but uh, which is something I, I covered some with the Slender Man and I, I've lectured extensively on Tulpas, uh, but it's the concept that human energy can create something. And, you know, in a, in a basic sense, I think there's a lot of evidence that uh, some activity at certain locations is certainly created by the human element and uh, whether it's conscious or subconscious. So, you know, again, we have to look at all the different potentials. I mean, if, if someone talks about something long enough, you know, how real does it make it? How does it, uh, how does it affect it? You know, how, uh, how manifested does it become? And, and conversely, you know, if, if you've got a location that you constantly promote has haunted, and you promote a specific story, for instance, about that location. Does it create the ghost or does it draw some other spirit to the location that takes the form of that ghost because you've given it an opening? True. I can see that. That's just a couple of the potential possibilities. Absolutely. And like when I do investigations, what, what our, my team likes to do is we like for a residential house example, because you know how so-and-so will say that their house is haunted by five demons and three ghosts and you know how people get oh yeah excitable about i like to go in without having a client there just go in cold to oh, yes. run research like that and then bring the client in towards the end of the investigation to see if it's their energy like conjuring up that sort of absolutely situation. or is it something attached specifically to them absolutely Good which is that. you know often the case also mm -hmm. Um, tell me about your new book, Haunted Prisons. I am really enjoying this one. <laughs> so that's the latest uh, in the Haunted series that Ross and I have been working on. And the most difficult one to write. <laughs> that's it, what you were really, saying, yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, we were, we were on the phone. <laughs> we were on the phone constantly with each other, I think, complaining about that one and, and just oh my god i'm be so glad when this book is done man <laughs> you know what do you hear what i found today uh it goes back to that human element you know we had decided on this one of course a lot of people are fascinated by haunted prisons and they are certainly intense uh repositories for energy you know and uh trauma and and misery and you know all levels of, of just uh oh gosh human grief and horror and everything else that you can think of so it's kind of funny we we sat down initially to with an outline of the book and it covered prisons penitentiaries and jails and we kind of write in different ways you know we we'll also have a list and he'll start going through it systematically and when we're doing these things i i'll kind of jump around and just kind of feel which one i want to write next so I had written a, a couple of the, the jails actually, and they were okay, you know, uh, just kind of a, I hate to say generic, but you know, just sort of, oh, this is, yeah, this is a haunted jail. Here's a couple of cool stories, you know, and here we go. And then got to one of the penitentiaries and, you know, I, I'm doing all this research. And of course you have to do the research to find out, you know, the real story on some of the crimes and so forth. And man, I got partway through this and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, and we quickly realized, you know, the penitentiaries, the stories are so intense. And of course, a lot of them, he and I both investigated and we quick, quickly realized we had to kind of cut the book down some. We, so we took jails out because it didn't really fit, which really left us with all the most intense stories because the penitentiaries are the worst, you know, and the, and the prisons. So, yeah. Wow. I mean, it, it was something we, we hit some of the big ones, of course, you know, the well-known uh, Alcatraz, which we had both had experiences in 
uh, I wrote uh, Moundsville in West Virginia, uh, some of the more intense ones. And then uh, a few, you know, maybe lesser known too. And, and even a couple, we even cover, covered a couple that are still active facilities. Uh, I wrote a piece about Folsom Prison. And, um, you know, it's, you can't go there and investigate it or anything. Uh, the only way to get in is, is not a way you would want to be in there, obviously. But, uh, but there are some crazy stories that come out of Folsom Prison. And, you know, the, from both the guards and the prisoners. And of course, it's famous for Johnny Cash doing a concert there, uh, and and just having a you know phenomenal hit with the song. Mm-hmm. But yeah, these stories, man, they are so intense because you you start to maybe think about it in a different way. Like I said, I've, I've investigated a lot of these sites, but it's a bit different to go into an abandoned location and you know some of the stories and you pick up different things, you know. But then. Uh, really delving into the history and realizing how intense and how horrible some of these places were kind of gives another side to it. And that's really what we try to do with the series. You know, we, we like to cover the history and give the background for what we're showing as the hauntings and, uh, you know, clarify a lot of these stories because man, some of these haunted locations, questionable stories get associated with them, you know, or, or somebody will come in and make a claim and it sticks for whatever reason, but there's just no historical foundation or anything to support it. So we're really trying with the series to um, clarify and, and crystallize a lot of these haunted locations. And uh, I'm happy with the way it turned out. Everybody, I, I've had positive feedback from it and um I think it's, you know, it's maybe the best of the series so far. What is one story in in the book that still kind of sticks with you or keeps you kind of, ugh? Oh. um, I know with Ross, he didn't like the Civil War stuff. Well, it's not that he didn't like it. That was the stuff that kind of. Yeah, the uh, the Civil War, um, Andersonville. Yeah, that was. Yeah, he and I talked about that one extensively. It was it was pretty bad. Um, I have to think for a minute because you know, actually, a couple of the worst stories were really they proved to just be um, kind of fabricated or or you know exaggerated or or something. Uh, there's there's one. I don't know if it's it's the um, I, I don't know. There's there's one that kind of sticks with me a little bit, and it's the old Idaho uh, penitentiary. And there's two criminals that were in there, actually. One was known as Idaho's Jack the Ripper. And uh, he only killed one person. He killed uh, a woman named Cora Dean. Uh, but he he cut her up so badly that um, he, with a pocket knife, that he virtually uh, beheaded her. Wow. And he's just a, a very disturbing individual, uh, obviously. And he was uh, he was put to death in the penitentiary and his spirit still manifests. You know, they they say that uh, he manifests in the, the area where he was hung and that he also shows up curiously in town at an old cigar shop uh, because after he committed the crime, he casually walked into this place, uh, bloodied, walked into the bathroom and cleaned himself up and then walked back out. Wow. Uh, just, you know, completely like it's another sunny day. And, uh, you know, that kind of disturbing individual. I mean, when you read this stuff and think, oh, my gosh, uh, <laughs> you know, what's was this guy even human? You know, curiously, there was an, a, a female at that prison also who they nicknamed uh fly paper Lydia uh fly paper Lydia and she she uh she was basically a black widow she was collecting husbands and killing them uh with poison and married one after another after another and and was collecting insurance policies and uh <laughs> she she started off with killing her whole family her her husband her husband's brother and her kid and systematically one after the other and collected the insurance on each one. And, you know, in modern times, we, we stop and think, 
why did nobody figure out, <laughs> you know, what this woman was doing or, or raise any questions? And then she quickly gets married again and does the same thing, you know, to another husband. And then uh, she kind of moved around and, and did this several times. And she's kind of, there's something kind of creepy about her because she ended up getting released and they don't really know what happened to her other than the, the rumor that she ended up in uh, Utah and married somebody else. And, and you, so you're, so you're left with this, huh? What happened to that guy? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, being a figure in the paranormal field, you meet a lot of investigators from beginner to well-seasoned. Um, Paranormal teams and paranormal investigating is blown up. It's becoming more and more popular. A lot of people are doing it. Um, what advice do you give newbies when they're getting into the field? Don't get your experience by watching television. Well uh, <laughs> I, agree. I, I, ha I, have, I have heard people vouch to me that their credentials were having seen every episode of Ghost Hunters. Uh, you know, or every episode of, you know, fill in the blank of your favorite paranormal show. Uh, that's not training. That's not, <laughs> you know, that, that doesn't give you the knowledge base that you really need. Uh, I, I tell people to read, you know, I, I say, learn about the field, read about the, the founders, the early people that were investigating haunted locations. Uh, read about different techniques, you know, uh, understand the equipment that you're using. It's surprising how many people don't, you know, oh, I've got, you know, here's this cool whatever, and it, it lights up and it makes these noises. Uh, oh, that's a spirit that's present. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, I remember running into someone at, at a location and a uh, pair, pair of people, it was in the middle of the night, the location, I thought there was no one else there. It was an old hotel and uh, I was, I was investigating. I thought there was no one else there. And I, I'm coming down this hallway. It must've been, you know, two, 3 AM. And I kid you not, Mike, it, it, it sounded like a tinker's wagon coming down the hall. I heard all this clinks and clanks and I'm thinking, what the heck is this? Is like maintenance or what? Here come these two investigators with you know the vest on and all this equipment hanging off and it's all clacking together and clicking together and they've got they've got a meter and they stop and they're like oh, wait right here and the meter's going off and um you know they that's not the whole story because they thought at first i was an apparition because i was at the end of the hall so i had to approach and start talking to these people you know and then they got very excited because their meter was going off and i i kindly pointed out that's interesting however you know you're standing beside this uh this panel box <laughs> you know this is all electrical pan oh no 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 this is flashing this means the spirits are here it's like the phone app <laughs> it is yeah and you you can't you know you can't really dispute that and it, it's kind of it's kind of funny. It's also kind of sad because, you know, you have to say, wow, you know, this is someone who just, they don't know what this equipment does. They don't know how to properly use it. And uh, I'm all for testing various types of equipment, but for God's sakes, understand what it does and what it doesn't do. And, you know, understand what the positives and negatives are of using that equipment. So, yeah, I mean, lots of different advice for, for newcomers, you know, get in, Get in with people that are, you know, have a solid background and, and let them show you the ropes. You know, don't don't assume because you've seen a dozen episodes of something and, and you bought a K2 meter and a recorder that you're automatically uh, an expert in the field. So that's why I'm always bugging Ross. <laughs> but, um, yeah. yeah, no, at Wolf, I was at Wolf Creek. It just kind of like your story with people walking around. I was trying to go to sleep in my hotel room, Wolf Creek Inn in Oregon. Yeah. And um, this was after my investigation that I was authorized to do. And yeah. um, all of a sudden, I hear a, a REM pod beeping outside of my hotel door oh, yeah. because I was in one of the haunted rooms. Yeah. And there's ghost hunters, and they're like, knock. They knocked on my door, and they're like, if you're here, knock back. Oh, yeah. And, and they know you're staying there. <laughs> but, How did you resist that temptation? That's oh, the question. <laughs> I should have growled. <laughs> No, but you know, the, I mean, the best thing to do if you're, if you're a newcomer really is to find a mentor. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's surprising, uh, you know, how many people don't take the time to do that. And the thing is, is that um, I know most of the people in the field, the ones that have been around for a while, you know, they're more than happy to, to answer questions and, you know, to help guide you. But uh, it's also surprising how many people jump into the field and, and they want to be instantly an expert and they quickly pad their resume and, and, you know, claim a lot of experience that, <laughs> you know, they don't really have. And, uh, you know, they just can't, can't openly admit that, Oh, I, I just, I'm interested in this, but I just started, you know, uh, here's some questions and wow. It's, it's surprising how many people won't do that anymore. Yeah, no, I, I think I ask Ross a question a week on, on certain things. I, I look up to Ross. He's a good guy mm -hmm. with that stuff. Um, we have about five minutes left before Zoom kicks me off. I want to pick your brain about haunted dolls. I, I like I like the book, the Haunted Toys book. Mm -hmm. um, what makes a haunted object, and have you experienced one? Oh yeah, I've got lots of haunted objects, and uh, certainly I've, I've experienced a lot of them. Uh, the The whole doll concept that's somewhat different. Uh, I did a whole separate book on that. Just um, Eerie Companions, the history of haunted dolls, uh, because there are so many things that can make a doll haunted. You know, there are uh, historically a lot of different reasons that dolls were used that have nothing to do with being toys. Uh, you know, they've been used all over the world in different magical rituals. They've been used uh, to heal people. They've been used to curse people. Of course, the voodoo doll is, is the most well-known uh, doll that's used in a malicious manner uh, but there are other things too that uh, different cultures have have utilized dolls for in in a more sinister fashion uh, to answer your question in terms of dolls there's a number of ways that they can be become haunted uh, one is that uh, they could be used in some kind of uh, a magical ritual that instills them with energy uh, that energy doesn't go away it stays with the object uh, likewise uh, you can have an object, uh, a doll is often the uh, object of affection for a young child. And you have to understand that, you know, if a kid grows up with that doll for years, uh, giving it a name and instilling energy into it, and uh, in some ways putting a part of their essence into the doll, then to a certain degree, it, it holds that child's energy and it becomes... Uh, it can, in a sense, take on an, an essence, a, a life force of its own to a degree. And then, of course, we have the more infamous idea that a entity can take up residence in a doll because it resembles a human. And uh, this is where we get into the more uh, demonic stories, you know, like the concept of uh, Annabelle, of course, being the, the most well-known. Uh, but... Uh, there are a lot of other stories out there that are kind of similar to that, much lesser known, that involve a, a, a very sinister energy coming in and wanting to, to plague a person or a family and using a doll as the vessel because it's uh, familiar in some way. And again, it, it looks somewhat like a human. You find a lot of curious things, you know, the, the Amish, for instance, they, they don't put faces on their dolls. And, uh, you know, there's a whole idea that they can't make anything that truly resembles a human because it's uh, dangerous spiritually. And I think that's kind of interesting to think about in those terms, because you're you're saying to a degree that uh, if it's too close to human, it can take on some kind of quality mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, you know, resembles a haunting. So those are a few of the ways that dolls can become haunted. All right. And in closing, what do you want to do this year if you can do any sort of investigating exploring where do you want to go oh gosh i have a busy year uh i have a number of books that are coming out still this year i have a few film projects um i i'm trying to think if there's any i can mention yet <laughs> i don't think there are uh, but you know there's always bucket list places i guess we'll have to wait and see what happens with all the craziness with travel and everything and uh, you know, hopefully I'll be able to go overseas again and, and investigate things in some other countries once again, because uh, gosh, it's been, you know, over a year now since I've done that. I'm going stir crazy. I love yeah. being in the States to investigate. So yeah, 
But all right. Well, thank you for your time. And I enjoyed this. Hey, my pleasure, man. Thanks. Thanks.